Ken Kirzinger, a renowned stunt performer and coordinator, has been behind some of the most explosive action sequences in film and television for over 40 years. Starting with Superman 3, he has worked on countless productions creating some of the most memorable moments in cinematic history. Get ready to learn from a true master of stunts and action. Please welcome Ken Kirzinger. Hi, I'm Ken Kirzinger and this is Stunt Archives. Ken, thank you so much for taking the time. My pleasure, my pleasure. Nice to be here. Yeah, how are you doing? Good, yeah. As good as an old stuntman gets. <laughs> <laughs> good to hear. You're looking good. Thanks. Uh, where did you grow up? Uh, I was born in Saskatoon, but I was raised in Victoria uh, in, on Vancouver Island and um, didn't move over to Vancouver until I went to university here. Cool. Where'd you go to school? I went to Oak Bay High School and I played basketball at UVic and then I switched over to football at uh, UBC, which is what uh, brought me to Vancouver. When did you start your career as a stunt performer and how did you get into the industry? Uh, I started my career in grade three, jumping off the roof of the school and breaking my ankle. <laughs> <laughs> I read an article about stuntmen when I was 12 years old and uh, uh, about Hal Needham, very famous stuntman. And it was something that I just tacked away in the back of my mind and that I really wanted to look into at some point in my life. I was in college, I was playing football at the time and uh, blew my knee out and decided that that was a good time to go down in, to LA and look into becoming a stuntman. Uh, my sister was living in Los Angeles. I had no contacts there. Went down without knowing anybody. Turned out her next door neighbor was the property master on Fall Guy, the TV series, which was all about stuntmen. He gave me the phone number of a stunt guy on the show. I spoke to him and he gave me John Wardlow's phone number in Vancouver. When I got back to Vancouver, I was still going to university and I called John up and I spoke to him for about two hours on the phone uh, about stunt work and where it was going in Vancouver and, and uh, you know, what the possibilities were and uh, just got really excited about it. And I think it was only a matter of weeks later, I was working on my first uh, movie, Superman 3, in, uh, in uh, Alberta. Superman 3, they had a big action sequence. It was a, a, a chemical refinery disaster. They needed uh, firemen running in, in and around the fire and the explosions. And uh, um, that's primarily what I was doing. So it was sort of ND uh, firemen. I remember the first stunt I actually did was with Alex Green. And uh, it was, they were blowing out the corner of this building and we were two firemen pulling a hose on the ground and had to react to that. And, uh, and that was my first stunt. So. I think I got three days on that, running through fires and, and out smoky buildings and stuff. And at that time, they were using real uh, uh, lighting tires on fire for the ambient smoke. So we were breathing burning tires all day. Um, things have changed uh, for much for the better. Um, but that was my, those were my first three days uh, working on uh, Superman 3. Uh, and uh, the, the door just opened after that. And uh, as more work came, I started working more and more. Wow, that must have been a pretty incredible experience. Like, I'm not sure if Superman was really uh, something you like read growing up or anything like that, but well, for to be part of The funny thing is, that is that, canon? so growing up, I was told how much I looked like Christopher Reeves. Oh, wow. And uh, when I got there, they're like, wow, you'd be a really good double for Christopher Reeves. But I mean, we already have a double for, for Chris, and, and uh, but um, we're, they're talking about coming back to Alberta to shoot the next one which they didn't, but they did speak to me about possibly doubling Christopher Reeves. And uh, as the years went by, I ended up doubling Christopher Reeves a couple of times over the years. So um, I never got to put the Superman suit on. I was just, I would have loved to, <laughs> but, um, but it wasn't to be, not yet. Maybe, maybe they'll call me tomorrow. I don't know, but. <laughs> <laughs> Hey, you know, you're at least, you, come on, it's pretty iconic also to be Jason, so that... Well, that's, that, that's pretty good, too. That's pretty, <laughs> you know? Yeah. Um, how, how did you balance acting and stunt performing in your career, and which one do you prefer? You know, I, so I started acting almost by accident because uh, I, I got cast as, you know, goons and thugs and, you know, henchman number one, henchman number two. I think, I think I had to work my way up to henchman number one. I was down at henchman number three. Um, but uh, then one day on set, I, they just told me, uh, here's your sides. And I'm like, what? <laughs> you got lines. And uh, so I had a couple of lines and, and uh, I remember how nervous I was doing them. Um, but 
I did all right. And uh, I ended up getting uh, uh, an agent and uh, getting cast as more and more thugs and baddies and stuff. And I don't know, it came fairly natural because, I mean, before I was just playing thugs without saying anything. So, you know, one or two lines didn't make that much difference, but yeah. it gave me more and more confidence to do more and more acting. And, and uh, eventually I started uh, auditioning for just, just acting roles. But uh, in the meantime, it was hard because I would get a stunt coordinating job, which was, you know, weeks and weeks worth of work and get a small acting gig that was like three or four days. <laughs> And of course, I'd have to turn down the acting gigs, and and uh, that didn't make my uh, my acting agent very happy, and and uh, so I went th went through a couple of those because um, I was sort of almost at the peak of my stunt career at yeah. the time. Um, but uh, yeah, so I sort of did made stunt work the priority, and acting the the secondary thing, and uh, always really enjoyed it. And as time went by, I got more and more you know acting gigs. Do you think it's important for stunt performers to take acting classes? Oh, definitely. Yeah, I mean, what they're doing is acting. I mean, uh, nothing worse than watching a great scene and then having somebody in the background who's, you know, just not selling yeah. it at all. Yeah. And, and it draws your, your attention to that. And, and, you know, directors notice that. They're looking for those details. So, yeah, I think it's very important that uh, people, uh, stunt people, take some acting classes and get to get to feel comfortable with that because they might feel fine doing a fight scene but throw a fight scene in with some dialogue and that can screw them all around yeah. it's a funny thing that happens when you put a camera on people and they're you know in a different situation yeah. uh, it can lead to some uh, funny and, and sad mistakes <laughs> <laughs> yeah. what was the most challenging stunt you have ever performed in your career and how did you prepare for it uh, a car stunt I did for a movie called hideaway and I was doubling Jeff Goldblum. And uh, there was a scene where he's driving his family down the mountain at night and there's a gravel truck coming up the road. The gravel truck drifts into my lane and as I come around the corner, I had to slide the car sideways at a 90 degree angle and, and hit the front of the, uh, the gravel truck, spin off 360, and uh, then the car goes off the side of the road. And the way, the way I remember the way I prepared for that was I had an old uh, Dodge Diplomat, you know, it was the standard car for all the police cars and everything. That was my slide car. So I took that and I had a, a, an 88 Corvette and I took a buddy of mine out and I said, okay, you're going to be the truck and he's driving my Corvette. And I, and I just worked on my timing where, where he would be coming at me and I would slide the car beside it yeah. until I got the timing right and the speed and uh, to the point where I was, I was hitting it pretty much every time. And, uh, that was the rehearsal. And then we went out and shot it that night and we got it in first take. And uh, I didn't splatter myself like a bug on the front of a gravel truck. How amazing. Yeah. I'm very happy to hear that. Yeah, <laughs> me too. <laughs> Can you tell us about your experience of becoming the first president of Stunts Canada after the legendary Alex Greed? Yeah, it was big shoes. Um, Alex had been president and uh, he announced to the group that uh, that he wanted to step down as president. And I was, uh, I don't know, I think five or six years into uh, being a member of Stunts Canada at the time, but I was still one of the young guys. And I, but I was really ambitious and, uh, and I really wanted Stunts Canada to be more and, and to evolve, model ourselves after the uh, LA stunt groups. So, I, you know, I, when I went to Alex and told him I was thinking about running for president, he goes, and I told him what I wanted to do, and he goes, "Do it." So it's, those are all great ideas, and that's all the you know the direction that we should be headed in. So he encouraged me, and uh, yeah, once I got in, we got to implement that, and I think that helped push uh, Stunts Canada a little bit further along. And I had a lot of pride in that. Yeah, yeah, as you should. That's pretty mm. incredible. Yeah, like, yeah. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> I think I was, you know, when I was president of Stunts Canada, I was still in my twenties. Um, you know, I'm still pretty young. Was was leadership something very natural to you, though, growing up? Probably. I mean, I'd always been captain of whatever teams yeah. I was on and stuff. And, and uh, um, you know, I, my attitude was always sort of lead, follow, or get out of the way. Yeah. And, and uh, so, yeah, I think uh, leadership... You know, I don't know if I want, I'm going to call myself a natural I'll call you leader, that. I'll call you uh, leader. <laughs> but, but, I, but it felt right to do yeah. what I was doing. I, did, I wasn't intimidated by the job of being uh, president or, or anything that came along with it. 
because back then, you know, if you, you could, you get a bullseye on your back. Sometimes if you're in a, if you're representing the group, yeah. then you are, you know, you, you know, and somebody doesn't like the group. Well, you know, you're going to, you're going to pay a little of the price for that. What is your role as a stunt coordinator and what are the challenges of coordinating stunts for a film? The role of the stunt coordinator um, is the safety of the set uh, when it comes to uh, action. So you're not only responsible for what's going on, you know, in front of the camera, but what could happen behind the camera. And that's a big responsibility. Um, you know, equipment can break and you have, you know, tires can blow. Um, you know, a cabled off fence, a uh, chain link fence can, can snap the cable and fly off in different directions. And you have to anticipate all that, um, which is hard, it, it, you know, to, to, you have to look at each stunt and see where you think it could go wrong and, uh, and then hope for the best, you know, you, you know, plan for the worst and hope for the best. So there's a tremendous amount of responsibility on stunt coordinators. And, you know, I'd had uh, stunt people get injured on set and uh, it's a terrible feeling. Um, but, you know, it's part of the job because you've had it happen to yourself as well, you know. Um, and back in the day, it was, uh, if you got hurt, the, it was like, you don't show it. You go off around behind the trailer and you collapse if you have to, you know, tell, tell the other stunt guy. But you didn't want to show that you had been hurt doing a stunt. And uh, that was the wrong thing to do. You know, these days I encourage anybody, you know, if you're injured, report it. It happens. And, uh, but back then people worried about how it would, might reflect on the stunt coordinator, yeah. how it might reflect on their own skills. Uh, but in the long run, if you have a long run as a stunt performer, all those little injuries are going to add up over time. And, uh, you know, you take enough head punches, you know, you're snapping your neck and, 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 and you know, that's, you're, you're giving yourself whiplash. Yeah. You crash a car, whiplash, that neck is taking a tremendous uh, beating. So the uh, role of a stunt coordinator is to watch for what could happen and, uh, and then look after your stunt people and make sure that they're, you know, if they are injured, that they're taken care of, that they report it and uh, uh, that they look at the long-term effects of things. You know, people always ask me, what's the most dangerous stunt you ever did? And I always say, the stunt that went wrong. You know, because you're not supposed to get hurt. You're not supposed to, you know, uh, um, you know, flip a car off the side of the mountain uh, or, or an open Jeep, with a, you know, it had a roll bar and a lap belt. And, but it broke down. And uh, so there was a, an extra there who had a Jeep that was very similar. It was brown. The one we were using was black. So they just, they got his Jeep and they, I think they did it with streaks and tips, you know, uh, uh, the black streaks and tips and turned it into a black Jeep. And so that's the one I was driving when, when uh, we had an accident. So what, what happened was I was supposed to come up behind this limo full of bad guys and I'm a good guy and there's a semi-trailer truck ahead and uh, I, I bumped the bad guys off the road. They're supposed to slide off the side of the road like this and I gunned it around them. And uh, what happened was the, the, the limo turned into me and, uh, and I, so I bumped them and then I goosed it to go around them and the limo turned into me instead of sliding off the side of the road away from me and I hit the Jeep hip and it flipped upside down, landed upside down uh, in the road. Um, it was, a, like I say, a roll bar that didn't come up to the top of my head and a lap belt. Now I thought about it ahead of time. Again, what would you do if this went wrong and the Jeep flipped? And, and I pre-programmed myself. I told myself the only thing I could do is throw my arms over my head like this. And uh, so, boom, I hit this car and I can feel the Jeep going up and over. I know it's going to flip. And I throw my arms up over my head and I hit the pavement so hard. I was wearing a wig and, and, and the pavement actually tore, tore the wig off, uh, halfway off the top of my head. It scuffed the watch face off. It, it, uh, I smashed my elbow into the pavement and it bent the driver's seat back. And then it righted itself onto its wheels and went off the side of the road backwards down, uh, we were in Cypress mountain. I can't remember now, but anyway, it started going back down the hill and I was kind of stunned, but not knocked out. And uh, fortunately the, the Jeep was, it was, had a, a fairly high powered engine. It was, and it, it actually idled itself back up the hill while I gathered myself. And so back up onto the road. And I, and I remember thinking to myself, I got to stop before I go off the other side into this ditch. So I lift my foot way up and I stomp on the brake, stop in the middle of the road. And my elbow's killing me. And, and I look and the crew is running and women are screaming. And, 
and because they thought I had torn the top of my head off uh, because of the wig and stuff. And um, uh, Gary McClarty, who was, uh, he was driving the limo and he was the stunt coordinator on the show. He comes running up to me. Gary McClarty had been in the helicopter uh, that crashed uh, that when Vic Morrow was killed, uh, very famous. So he was no stranger to disasters on set kind of thing. And he just ran up to me and he saw that I was alive. And that was, that was all he needed to know. He goes, Oh, thank God you're alive. And, uh, I go, yeah, it's just, I, and my elbow really saved me, you know, throwing my arms over my head really saved my head. Um, and, uh, yeah, you know, that was, uh, that, that, that was a, a, a case of where the stunt goes wrong. You know, nobody's supposed to get hurt. But if the stunt goes wrong, there's no guarantees. We were doing a, a series called um, uh, Police Academy. And uh, there's a scene where I was doubling this actor and he starts in this bell tower on a, on a, on a zip line and he zips down out of the bell tower down to uh, where the recruits are lined up and he drops to the ground and he tuck and roll, get up in a fighting stance. So uh, I'm up in the bell tower and, uh, and I leap out and uh, the pulley that they were using was the wrong kind of pulley. There was a gap between the, uh, the pulley and the side of the pulley. So when I bounced, it bounced up and got stuck and boom, I just stopped at the highest point in the zip line out this bell tower, I don't know, 30, 40 feet. And now I'm, I'm hanging over the ground and what do we do? Uh, so, uh, there's some porta pits over there and I just yelled out a little help. And, uh, there were some stunt guys. They ran over, they got a porta pit and they put it underneath me and I dropped down to do it. So now we're going for take two and, uh, I get back up there and I go, did you change the pulley to the effects guy? And he goes, we don't have another pulley. He goes, just don't bounce as hard on it. Just don't bounce. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> so I said, okay, you know, cause anything to get the shot and make yeah. it work. Now I knew that that was a possibility. I eased into it and we, did the, uh, the stunt and, and uh, got the second take and it all went right. Yeah, you got to anticipate things. Uh, what are some injuries that you've had in your career? Um, I always say I got to start at my toes literally and work my way up. But, you know, because I've, I've broken toes, I've fractured ankles, I've, I've uh, torn ligaments in my knees, I've fractured three vertebrae in my back, I've, you know, had uh, severe whiplash. I've, you know, uh, these are all things that... Uh, you know, happen. Stunt work is a 100% injury job. If you play professional football, the injury rate is 100%. If you do stunt work, the injury rate is 100%. You do it long enough, hard enough, you're going to get hurt. Um, so those are all things I live with now and they're coming back to haunt me. But I, you know, and I remember when I was a young stunt and one of my mottos was, you know, you can't hurt steel. You know, I, I just had this ego that, uh, you know, uh, you know, I'll do the stunt or I'll die trying, you know, um, and, and then you mature, <laughs> you get enough injuries and everything and you mature, you think, okay, I want this career to last a little longer. Yeah. Um, so, you know, that's, a, a you know, something to take into consideration. Yeah, totally. What is the most rewarding aspect of working as a professional stuntman and what keeps you motivated? You know, you, all the good stunt people I've met and, and most of them, they have a passion. They have a passion for what they do. And, uh, that passion makes going to work after a 16 hour day and getting four hours sleep and then going back to work somehow makes that, you know, weeks on weeks on weeks on end somehow makes that bearable. You're having fun doing what you're doing, even though it's unbelievably long hours and hard work. So it's a passion for the, uh, passion for the business that you'll see in all good stunt people, all good actors, all anybody who's any good at what they do as a job have a passion. And, and I've seen the passion leave people. You know, I've seen uh, first ADs that got a chance to direct and then went back to being a first AD and, and it was just not, they weren't the same people anymore. And, uh, and stunt work, you know, I've seen, I've seen that happen to people too, where, you know, they get injured and uh, all of a sudden they're a little leery about going to work because they've had a pretty bad uh, injury. So passion is, uh, is what carries us all through, I think. Yeah. How do you work with actors to help them perform their own stunts safely and convincingly? You know, you have to do an assessment. You, have to, you need to speak to them and see how comfortable they are. Um, 
I remember I was doing a, an episode of X-Files and it was an episode where people were catching fire and, and, uh, and I went to this older gentleman and they, there's a scene where they, his hand burst on fire. And uh, so I rigged up a, a glove that looked like a real hand and, and uh, um, went to the, the older gentleman. I said, they, you know, they, they're asking me if I can let, light your hand on fire. And, uh, you know, fire gags are really psychological. Uh, you know, I'm on fire, <laughs> you know, versus, oh, I'm on fire. Uh, and so I, this old guy says to me, he goes, he goes son, he goes, I, I flew fighters in the Second World War. He goes, I've been on fire. And uh, I, I said, his whole attitude and everything was totally cool. And I, he did the stunt and it came off perfectly and he had no fear at all. Um, but if I had gone up to him and, and just mentioned it to him and saw the look in his face, you know, you have to do that, that assessment and see what they're game and willing to do. I mean, if you're working with Tom Cruise, you don't have to worry about it. He'll do, he'll, he'll, I always see Tom Cruise, he gets interviewed, would you do this? And he goes, well, that's, I'd assess it. You know, because so, you know, it's, he looks at it from a very practical point of view and other people look at it more from a gut point of view. And, uh, uh, you know, you're not gonna do that to them. Um, so yeah, you have to assess them and, uh, and, and make a judgment call on whether or not they can handle what is being asked of them. And some of them will just come out and tell you, you know, I want to do it. <laughs> yeah. I don't want to do it. Uh, and then you, you know, you go in and you take the heat for them and yeah. say, there's no way I'm letting an actor oh, do no. this stunt, you know, <laughs> yeah. and you, 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 you take it on yourself to, to say no. And um, uh, so judging the actors is, is I think the most, the, the biggest thing. You know, I worked with Al Pacino once and he was surprisingly athletic. Oh, cool. Yeah. And game. Wow. Um, so you get surprised by that. Do you mind telling us about your experience working with Al Pacino and Robin Williams on the film Insomnia? Yeah, it, it was a bit intimidating meeting uh, uh, Al Pacino for the first time because Al is about five foot six. And, uh, and uh, I, the director was Christopher Nolan, uh, who, who hadn't made it quite so big time yet, but he still had a big name for himself. Uh, so uh, when I met uh, Al, I had to make up my mind and my, you know, uh, my instincts were Mr. Pacino, you know, uh, and, and I thought, no, you know what? I got to work side by side with this guy. And uh, so I called him out when I met him, I shook his hand. He kind of looked up at me, nothing else was said. And, uh, but um, he was really cool to work with. Um, he, like I said, he was very athletic and I wasn't afraid to go up to him and, and uh, uh, ask him to do something. And, um, got over the whole intimidation, you know, being intimidated by that. And Robin Williams, I was very fortunate um, that uh, 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 Mike Mitchell, who's in, in Stunts Canada, had been doubling uh, Robin since uh, Jumanji. And uh, so I, of course, hired him to, to double Robin on the show. And that was an automatic in. Um, and uh, uh, Laurel Chartrand, I had him doubling El Pacino, and they each had great relationships with them and uh, just made the job so much easier uh, to, to, to work with these huge stars. And, uh, you know, they've worked with the best people in the world, so they, you know, they, they know what's what, and uh, there's no fooling them. Um, so I just went in, I did the best job I could, and, and uh, uh, all the stunts went well, and, and uh, everybody was happy, and so, so I was happy. Can you tell us about the log jam sequence in Insomnia? Yeah, it, 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 so we had, uh, this sequence where uh, Al is uh, having a foot chase with uh, Robin Williams' character, and they end up running across a log boom, and uh, Al's character ends up falling between the logs and underneath the log boom. Uh, so we had two parts we were, we were shooting at, at an actual wood mill on the island, and we had built a fake log boom that uh, logs would separate, but underneath was a cage. And the cage was so that whoever went under under the water, we, we would know exactly where they were. And then we put two safety divers in the cage as well. But the log boom had to move. And any kind of water force, so it will, you know, you can't fight that. It, 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 uh, so Laurel Chartrand did the stunt. And uh, all I could think about was, okay, he's got to go through these logs. And you hit cold water like that, and your first instincts are to gasp. But he's got to stay under. So I went, I went to Laurel and I have tremendous faith in him. Uh, I went to him and I said, do you want to get wet first? Like get, get your body used to the cold 
before you have to do this. And no, no, I'm good. I'm good. All right. So he, uh, we did it. And, uh, I think it was only one or two takes, but, uh, th there was a section where the logs were, were loose in the middle and, uh, he went down between them, disappeared. The two divers got him, yelled cut. And, uh, and I was nervous about that one because water gags are, are tricky things. And, you know, try to assess all the things that could go wrong. I mean, we looked at what was on the bottom, what could hit the cage, what, you know, because uh, what if the cage got torn off or something like that? And we had to, again, anticipate all these negative things and then, you know, hope for the best and uh, pretty confident going into it. But, but uh, Laurel was just perfect in it and uh, it, the stunt came off really well. And then we had to shoot some tank stuff with, uh, with Al and, uh, and Robin and Al. Al could hold his breath for about three seconds. <laughs> he, he just did not like being underneath the water. <laughs> But we were in the tank and we had, I remember we had like three safety divers, you know, walk him out to his location and where he was shooting in the water and stuff. And, and, uh, he was very nervous about that, but, but, uh, but he did it and, uh, we, we got a great little sequence out of it. Um, so yeah, I was pretty happy with that one. What are some other films that you've worked on that you're proud of? Well, I, you know, it, the, the movies where you get to double somebody like, like uh, hideaway, uh, doubling Jeff Goldblum on that, I, you know, it's, it's fun to see look at it and say, yeah, I did all the stunts in, in that. I mean, I still fractured my back on that one, but, uh, for one of the stunts I had to, they, uh, they had a railing set up. We were supposed to fall out of the sculpture and they had a railing set up about this high off the ground with a camera down, down low. And we were standing up and we were supposed to flop onto the concrete. And I didn't get my heels down fast enough and uh, ended up landing pretty much on my back. And uh, uh, that put me out. But luckily that was near near the end of the movie. I'd done all the other stunts. Uh, but I was pretty proud of that. And I mean, there's there's a lot that I've done over the years that, you know, uh, you, you do a one take, a, you know, perfect stunt and you go home feeling like a million bucks. You know, if you screw up once or twice and you go home kind of grumbling yeah. at yourself and, you know, you're talking to yourself and... and uh, yeah. But, uh, you know, that's all part of wanting to be perfect. It's funny, as an actor, you know, I, I, I've had people say to me, you know, I'll blow a line or something like that and, uh, and, and get mad at myself. And they go, why do you get so mad at yourself? And I said, because I'm used to being a stuntman. So my in in instincts were, you know, I got mad at myself. And uh, um, that that's, goes back to being a stuntman, wanting to get, it, get that in a wonder, you know, yeah. do it right the first time. Yeah, because as, if you're doing a gag, you can't call for line if you messed up. The gag. Right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Like, <laughs> Somebody move that airbag before I hit it. Yeah. The ground. <laughs> yeah. What was it like working with Kane Hodder on Friday the Thirteenth Part Eight? So Kane Hodder, uh, most people don't know, uh, has is the only guy that's played Jason uh, four times, yeah. and. Uh, when I met him, it was the second time he had played Jason. And actually, the first phone call I got for the show was, Hey, Ken, um, uh, doing Friday the 13th Part 8, uh, would you be interested in playing Jason and being the stunt coordinator? And uh, so I, I called up and left a message saying, Yeah, I'm, I'm in, I'm game. And then the next message I got was uh, Kane had made a deal to play uh, Jason the second time. And I never found out what that deal was or whatever, but he came back up and he played Jason the second time and then went on to play him two more times, four altogether. And then uh, I got called in to do the interview for the stunt coordinating job on, on uh, Freddy versus Jason. And I'm um, sitting with the uh, line producer and we're talking and, and uh, he's kind of looking at me not listening to what I'm saying and he, he knew that I'd worked on number eight and then he said he goes you know would you audition to play Jason and I said well what about Kane Hodder and he goes well they want to go a different direction they want somebody bigger and and, uh, and you you know we've been looking at hundreds of people and everybody from ballet dancers to, to gymnasts because they were worried about the movement and stuff and so I said sure I'll, yeah, I'll audition for it and uh, so I did, the audition was to wear the mask and they read the opening scene and I reacted to it with my eyes. Then they had me walk around the room and uh, that was it. I, I got the job and Ronnie met the director and, and, and got the job. But after that, Kane Hodder was really pissed off at me because he thought I had made some sort of deal to play Jason because, you know, uh, because it's such a big deal to play Jason. I didn't even know that. 
And I, I, I was, you know, initially thought, oh, good, I'll get to work with Kane again because we had had a good, you know, rapport uh, working on number eight. And he had made a point of coming up to me and he, he goes, thanks for making me look good. And because and, I had doubled him, you know, playing Jason. And uh, uh, thanks for and You can really tell when guys know their stuff. You know, he, he came up and he complimented, but he was pissed. <laughs> about me getting Jason and Freddie versus Jason. So that's why I asked. Yeah, that's why I wanted to ask. <laughs> but there was a while there where he was not happy. Yeah. Um, can you talk about the challenges of performing stunts while wearing a heavy Jason? Oh, actually, you know what? The, the Jason costume wasn't bad other than it, my vision was limited because I one eye was fake. And uh, so I could only see out one eye. And of course, that removes a lot of your depth perception and stuff. But I have done way worse, uh, I call them suit jobs. Uh, I've been a Sasquatch, a werewolf, a robot, you know, uh, um, uh, Jason. And the worst one by far was this, was the werewolf costume I had to wear for a movie called Bad Moon. And uh, I was in this thing for hours and hours every day. And I was not claustrophobic at all when I started, you know, started the movie. But by the end, you know, I was, it, it was, I was, you know, having to go to my happy place to stay in this suit because I'm, I'm looking at a hole this big and uh, the, the jaws opened and closed. So when the jaws closed, I couldn't see. And it would it was set up to drool and I had uh, uh, animatronic battery pack on my back. So the whole suit weighed about 85 pounds and they had made it two sizes too small so it would fit extra tight. And they'd made it out of this really hard uh, uh, type of, of rubber with and foam because I was going to be fighting real attack dogs. And so I'm in this suit for hours and hours fighting real uh, 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 attack dogs. And uh, I remember just sort of sitting there and people would come up and push me thinking I was stuffed because I wouldn't move. I would just sit there and zone out and be, you know, someplace else. But that was worse. I remember the last day of filming, we shot all night and uh, I was just so happy. The sun had come up and I was on my way home and I picked up a bite to eat at McDonald's, some breakfast, and I drove down to the beach and I just sat there and was so thankful I didn't have to put that suit on again. It was horrible. It was it was never uh, never fun uh, wearing the wearing the suits. You, you're always it's always makes things a little bit harder. They you know they restrict your movement and stuff like that. But I I I, I remember the Sasquatch one I did uh, in, uh, MacGyver. I was I was happy because I had a fight scene with uh, Richard Dean Anderson and stuff and. Um, they were, you know, at that age, they were they were still fun to do, but that werewolf one was just awful. Bad moon. Oh, yeah. <laughs> bad moon. Yeah, bad moon. They used to call me the sad werewolf because they just see me, because I just sit there uh, uh, and, like I say, just meditate or just let my mind go someplace else because they wouldn't let me take the head off very often. But, uh, you know, suffering for the art. What are some of the most important issues facing stunt performers in the industry today? I think... Uh, if you're speaking about all stunt performers, it's, uh, it is um, learning to the, the, the boundaries of what your body can take and, the, and knowing the fact that this, these things are going to add up you know, over time kind of thing. I think that, you know, I was certainly not made aware, made aware or thought of it in any way uh, that these things are going to be cumulative, you know, concussions, cumulative neck injuries, cumulative. Um, so I think that, uh, you know, uh, stunt people today need to be aware of that. I, I was, I did a movie where, where I was cast as one of the lead actors and, and, uh, there was a, a pipe roll and I went and looked at, uh, the, the stunt guy, this is out in Winnipeg and, and, uh, he didn't have a Hans device on. And, uh, I, I went up to him afterwards and I, and, uh, told him what a Hans device was for us to save your neck. And, and, uh, you know, and he had never even heard of one. And, um, you know, so I said, get one. And if, cause if you're going to keep doing this, it's going to add up over time. So get a Hans device and, uh, and save your, save yourself because it might not, your neck's going to feel a little sore tomorrow, but that soreness is going to, is means you've injured it and it's going to add up over time. So I think the biggest thing for, for stunt people today is, is just be aware. Uh, it will take its toll uh, over time and, uh, don't ignore that. You know, it can cut your career short. Or uh, it could be the difference between cutting your career short or, or having a longer career in the business. So look after yourself. Look after your health. What was your favorite stunt to perform on any film or TV show and why? Oh, I think the big barroom brawls were fun. 
uh, you know, we get a bunch of stunt guys together and this is one of the things that we used to love to do. Um, there's a, a scene in Cool Running, a big barroom fight in Cool in Cruel Running, and, and there's this little, one little snippet where I punched somebody and, 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 I, and I smiled. And, and I smiled, that was a genuine smile. I was having fun, <laughs> you know, I was, this was just a blast. And, you know, we did Westerns where we did, you know, barroom brawls and stuff like that. So anytime you get a bunch of stunt, stunt guys together where you're doing a big barroom brawl or a bunch of stunt guys together and you're doing a big car chase, um, you know, big battle scenes. Those were always the most fun because you had the camaraderie, you were doing what you loved, um, you know, people were using their imaginations, how we can make our little sequence better and stuff like that. So I like, yeah, I like the big sequences with lots of stunt people. Uh, it, it was just, it was fun. It was what we were all there for. It, 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 we were getting paid to do stuff we'd probably been doing since we were kids, you know? Uh, so the camaraderie and, and the, those big sequences made, made them uh, a lot more fun. How has the stunt industry evolved since you first began your career? And what changes have you seen in terms of technology and safety measures? Um, safety has gotten better. Uh, I think it could even still get better. Um, things like measuring the force of impact uh, when you're going to ratchet a stunt guy into a concrete wall. You know, I think there's ways to measure the amount of G's that you should put on a person you know, do, doing that. The biggest thing that I've noticed is uh, more people are specializing. I, I meet young stunt people now and they, they go, oh yeah, you were an all rounder. You, you know, you did, you did all kinds of stunts. And, and uh, it's true. I mean, to work, one of the best parts of my job when I was younger was I had this big stunt bag and I'd put it in the, in the seat of my Corvette and I could go to work and I could do fire gags. I could do, you know, ratchets. I could do uh, uh, repelling stunts. I could do, you know, my fight scenes, stair falls, you know, pretty much a large variety, you know, car stunts. I had all my tools in there and stuff like that. And uh, so I just, you know, I just remember many times driving to work with the top down in the sun and the radio on my stunt bag and thinking I'm the luckiest guy in the world. You know, I am doing what I love to do, what I was meant to do. And, uh, and I'm going in to have fun. And, and uh, so that, you know, those were the good days. Those were the good days. What advice would you give to aspiring stunt performers who are just starting in the industry? I guess it would be to be really good at whatever you think you're bringing to the table. I mean, if you're a gymnast, uh, you know, you, you need to hone your martial arts skills as well because you're probably going to be doing a lot of fight stuff. Um, if you're a car guy, be the best car guy. Um, if you're going to do fire gags, be the best fire gag guy. Because there's people are doing that more. They're specializing. So be really good at that, that one thing that you, you think you're bringing to the table. And then you can start to expand, you know, and start to build your skills. And I recommend don't rest on your laurels. You know, learn other skills. The more you bring, you know, the more skills you have, the more you're going to work. And the more respect I think you'll get from, from stunt people as well. Um, you know, they bring a guy in because he can do, you know, certain flips and stuff like that, you know, he's, and, and throw a couple punches. It's, that's not the quality that you could be, you could be better. So be better, you know, uh, bring something to the table and then start adding, adding to your skills. What do you think makes the BC stunt community so special? I think there's still, um, when we were getting started and building an industry here, um, people had a sense of that in that, uh, you know, the, the props guy to the effects guy to the stunt guy, we were all representing each other. We were all trying to make each other look good and build a reputation. And, uh, and I still see that in the business and that is encouraging, uh, make each other look good. Um, you know, uh, it, it's the biggest uh, one of the best things you can do for yourself is to make other people look good. Uh, it'll come back to you and, uh, and hopefully they're doing the same thing. And I still see that. I still see some of that in the, in the business. It hasn't become too jaded or, uh, and people are still grateful, uh, a sense of community. You're part of a bigger whole and, uh, hopefully you're a contributing member. Yeah, community is it's very important, and, and uh, I had a real sense of that in the beginning of my career. Um, uh, Thomas, John Thomas, was uh, started out when he started out doing stunts, but he was too smart for that. He got into 
special effects. There's a studio here named after him, but he, uh, he was so terrific to work with. Um, I remember I had gotten in an accident doing a car chase one time and, and, uh, closest I ever came to getting killed. And, uh, the next day he was just there and he's going, he was, you tell me whatever you need. And, uh, because he knew that I'd be nervous coming back the next day, getting back on the horse and finishing the car chase with a fractured elbow. But, uh, he was just there for me and, uh, everybody was, uh, they, everybody wants you to do well. Everybody wants, you know, and we wish that for every department. Uh, uh, because we are a community and, uh, we make the community look good. And, uh, once, you know, once you've made up your mind, you got to go 110% in because other, other people who are deserving are going to do the same thing. Uh, they're going to put 110% in. I, I love to encourage, uh, people who I see just, just need that little push, you know, that little bit of confidence to, uh, to, to say, okay, I'm going to do it. I mean, we all need to encourage each other. Um, there's everybody has a point in their career where they get down for one reason or another. It could be an injury, it could be something, you know, uh, a lack of work over a period of time. And uh, everybody needs a, that little, you know, don't worry, it's going to be okay. Just stick with the program. Trust, trust the process. Work hard, um, and uh, you know, uh, honor this the community, and uh, and you'll do okay.